when Joseph learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Hermana Graciela, por favor, dar una oración por nosotros, ¿sí? En español también. Amen. You may be seated. Joseph is now second in command only to Pharaoh. The scripture teaches us that Joseph's rise to power was absolutely astounding. It can only be attributed to the hand of Almighty God in his life. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and then gives him wise, godly counsel on what to do because there was a time where there was going to be plenty, seven years of plenty. And then the Lord had revealed to Joseph that there were going to be seven years of famine. And so Joseph gives Pharaoh good advice and Pharaoh says, hmm, surely God's hand is on this young man. I'm going to make him my right-hand man. In fact, all of Egypt is going to answer to him. The only person that's not going to answer to him is me, is what Pharaoh uh, was saying, more or less. And so, Joseph used godly stewardship, built storehouses, and, and stored the grain, getting ready for the famine. Seven years of plenty. Now, I think all of us, this is a side note here, can say that we've lived in the land of plenty. And it's real easy to forget that bad times might come when plenty is coming on. Seven years of plenty, they're storing this up. Joseph stayed focused on what God had revealed to him, and sure enough, famine struck. Now, when you and I think of famine, I don't know that we can wrap our brains around what famine really is. I mean, there are some that are in here that, that may have been around uh, what we call the Great Depression in the United States. But I'm not sure that the Great Depression would even add up to what famine is in the land where people that live off the land re uh, require every bit of their sustenance from the land. Famine has been going on for two years now in this scene that we're reading here. And if you can imagine living in a pretty arid place anyway, I, I went to Lubbock last week. It was a great time at Lubbock. God really moved very powerfully. Uh, but while I was there, I noticed that, you know, these people, their yards look terrible. I mean, they're brown out there. The grass would crunch under your feet. 
And the thought hit me is, well, dummy, they don't have as much water as y'all have down in southeast Texas. Where we get too much water and the grass grows all the time. But you know what? I never heard any of them having to complain about mowing the grass up there. Just depends on how you look at things. But can you imagine living in a climate like that and going for two years without any rain and your animals have to eat the grass that is growing out there? After about two years worth of time, you could imagine that uh, the, your, your livestock started looking like spare ribs on the hoof. And when the animals don't have anything to eat and they get really lean, they start dying off. Well, if there's no grain and there's no produce being produced, you can't eat that. And so you look at the animal and then you look and you say, it's slim pickings tonight, sweetheart. And then people start dying when famines happen like that. And diseases start to spring up in the middle of those famines. It would be a terrible thing to watch one of your loved ones waste away and you not be able to give them a morsel of food for their comfort. And so this is the situation, the famine's about to happen. You know, uh, Sister Ivory Gomez, she's going to Africa to minister in two places next year. She's going to Sierra Leone, and she's also going to Ethiopia. And they know what famine is all about in them kind of places over there. Now listen to me. She told me that disease gets so bad there that they have diseases there now that are only in the textbooks over here. Nobody's ever witnessed them. But it's as a result of famine. No grass, the animals have no food, the animals die, people have no food, people die, disease runs rampant. That's the situation, okay? And the hard thing for us to wrap our minds around sometimes is that this was all in the plan and in the hand of Almighty God. Do you remember Joseph's dreams? He came to his brothers and told them, I had this dream. I was like a grain of corn, an ear of corn. And my, my grain of corn was lifted up, but your, your corn all bowed down to me. Well, that kind of made his brothers really upset with him, did it not? In fact, we wouldn't be at this portion of the story if it wasn't for that. So Jacob realizes that they will all die if something isn't done. And he sends all of his boys except one, Benjamin. Precious sweet Benjamin the daughter of his long lost Rachel whom he dearly loved he wasn't going to send Benjamin because he didn't want to lose his last loved son he didn't care about the other boys like he cared about Rachel's children he had a special relationship with them Joseph in his mind is dead but the boys knew where Joseph was Remember, they're the ones that sold him to slave traders that were going where? Egypt. And so Jacob has this conversation with his sons. He says, you guys need to get down to Jacob. And the scripture almost gives us a little insight of what's happening there. The boys look at each other. And he's like, why are you looking at each other like that? You know why. Some 20-something years have passed by at this point, but the sin that they committed a long time ago, God had not let yet them go on that. And they're looking at each other, uh-oh. But no way in their mind did they believe for a moment that Joseph was going to be the prime minister of Egypt when they got there. So the men make the journey to Egypt, and I want you to picture the scene. It would be kind of like, how many of you were raised out in the country? How many of you remember, the, how many of you that were raised in the country have ever been in New York City? Do you remember the first time that you went to New York City? Were you like Gomer Pyle? Golly! Shazam! That must have been what it was like for these boys when they were going into Egypt. These people were two years into the famine and it looked like everybody had meat on their bones and their livestock even looked good. They were still wealthy. They had things in that time. And when, when these boys were going into town, 
I don't know in their mind if they would ever imagine they'd be standing before the most powerful man in the world except for Pharaoh. But that's where they wound up. And so this is the scene that we walk in on and that's what we're coming to right here. And it's very important because today is going to be a little bit different. I want to talk to you about what's not there rather than what's there. And before you think I'm a heretic, I, I think you'll see that this is not just implied, but it's taught to us. Because it's a surprising lesson that takes place for all of us. Here's the scene. The boys are fulfilling prophecy. They're bowing down to Joseph just like God said it was going to happen. And if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen just like God said it was going to happen. And so that's what's taking place here. And a beautiful thing starts to come before us and it brings great humility upon me and perhaps you as well. Because this surprising lesson takes place. This is Joseph. He's the one that was mistreated by his brothers for telling them what God had revealed to him. Do you remember that? You don't think that he could be upset about that? Wait a minute. It gets worse. The brothers, the very ones that threw him into the pit, were going to leave him for dead, but wound up selling him into slavery. It's the same brothers that are before him now. It's the same ones. Years later, and Joseph has suffered a lot. Personally, he has suffered a lot. He's lost his family. He's lost his heritage, so to speak. He's been sold into slavery. And then he gets to Potiphar's house. And guess what happens there? Because of what his brothers did to him, he's sold as a slave in Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's wife wrongly accused him as well. He gets thrown into prison. And he's not in there for a month or two like they do here. He's in the pen for a long time. And I don't know about you, but an Egyptian prison cannot be anything like the prisons you and I can see here out on the side of 69. And so he's in prison. Do you think that he's had some opportunity to stew on if my brothers had not have sold me into slavery? Huh? Oh, yeah. And so here he gets released from prison. But before he's released from prison, he has a conversation with Pharaoh's butler. A divine conversation, by the way. And the last thing he tells Pharaoh's butler is, look, I did this for you. Please don't forget about me. Guess what butler did? He forgot about him. Do you think that Joseph had the opportunity to build up a case of, of bona fide, justified resentment because he had been wronged time after time after time? Hmm. Have you ever had anyone in your life do you wrong? By show of hands, let me see them. Anybody in here been done wrong? Have you ever had anybody steal something from you? Mm. Has anybody ever borrowed something from you but just never brought it back? Oh, there's more hands there. Have you ever had anybody destroy your property? Have you ever had anybody that betrayed you? Did that hurt? Maybe you had an ex-husband or an ex-wife that cheated on you. Maybe you had friends at school that ditched you so that they could be part of the cool crowd. And they quit being your friends. Can I ask you a question? What was your response? Did it hurt? Did you seek retribution? Be careful how you answer that. Were you the kind of person that if, they, if, if anything ever bad happened to those people that hurt you, that you said they got what they you see it teaches us about the problem of an unforgiving spirit I bet if you're like me you have experienced the 
grip of a grudge or the bite of bitterness or the reality of revenge in your life. And I imagine that if you have lived any time on this earth, you've been faced with the same issue, maybe not on the gravity that Joseph was faced with. But when you look at Joseph's life, you have to admit that there's something absent with his response. He had his moment. Men, you know what I'm talking about. We, we, we raise our children right. Amen? And when they mess up, our favorite phrase is, I told you so. Joseph had his ultimate moment right there. He had it. They were bowed down, and he could have went, Aha! I told you so. He could have done that. He could have taken a sword and lobbed their heads off for what they had done. He didn't do that. It's missing. In fact, if you and I were very honest, we all like to see, because we live in a society that says, paybacks rule, buddy. You hurt me or one of mine, you better expect it. And I've said it here. And I'm almost ashamed to say it's true. If somebody were to mess with my wife and daughter, look out. I'll be on you like white on rice. But is that the biblical thing that the scripture teaches us? You see, a lot of us like to keep a little list when somebody does us wrong. Am I right? Uh-oh, they gave me a wrong. I'm going to keep a check mark. And you'll come up and you'll tell the preacher sometime, well, you know, I love them. I just ain't got much for them. Or you might say something like this. Well, I can forgive, but I can't. So what happens is your little grudge gets worse and worse and you start looking to find fault in that individual. And you even can begin to see how good it will feel when you see that that offender feels the same hurt that you felt. Hmm. You wait. And you wait. And you wait patiently for the right opportunity to see that they pay. It's because we live in a society where paybacks rule. Somebody hurts you or a loved one and you may not physically do anything to retaliate to that person. And, and you become very cool and very calculating. You look down on them and, you may, and they may not even ever have the slightest idea that they've hurt you. You make sure to say and act in a way that others look on that person in a negative light. Hmm. And if he's wronged by someone, you come back and say, well, he got what he deserves. Justice has been served. And the problem is that you and I, sometimes we, we tend to try to justify our actions. We, 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 it could be go like this. Maybe you could... You could Ask somebody to help you. You know, let's just say that it's fixing to rain outside and you've got something really heavy out there and your neighbor that's a brother in Christ is there but they're, they're eating dinner right then. And you call them and say, hey neighbor, brother, I need some help. This, this valuable piece of furniture I have outside, it's fixing to rain and I got to get it inside the house but I don't have anybody to help me. And he says, man, I can't, this is family time. And you go, oh, okay, I see how it is. And that little bitterness starts up down inside there, you know. But you're at church on Sunday and you're going, how are you, neighbor? Oh, I'm fine, brother. Good to see you today. And you wait and you wait and you wait for the right opportunity. And one day he calls and he says, man, I, I, I don't know what to do, but my mower is stuck out in the ditch out front. And I need some help. Could you help me? And you go, no, man, I'm sorry. I always watch this program this time this week. You do something because you're not going to help him because paybacks. And you do it in such a way that he knows what you are doing. Am I starting to meddle a little bit right now? You've been there, haven't you? I want you to notice with me that you don't find any of this characteristics in Joseph's life, Joseph's life. In fact, those who have been forgiven by their sins, by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, those who have been given a new nature would never act that way, would they? And that new nature is the one that's saturated with grace, am I right? And mercy 
and forgiveness. I mean, even most every Christian, even a little child that is coming up in the way has heard the Lord's Prayer. The Lord teaches us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Uh Uh-oh. In the very same manner that we forgive those who trespass against this. Well, what are we praying when we pray like that? Is it just a rote memorization line prayer? Or are we saying, God, we really want you to forgive us in the same manner that we forgive other people? Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? He teaches us to bear with one another. Man, that's hard in the Christian life, isn't it? Some people take a little extra bearing, okay? Like you and I. Or me, excuse me, I'll say that right in a minute. Scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the the Lord. Well, I want you to look with me for just a moment about the precariousness of or the precarious position of an ungrateful soul. Joseph was constantly able to see the hand of God in every one of his circumstances. That's grace. Yes, he was going through tough times. Yes, he had been inflicted unjustly. He had been in prison and become a slave. Yes, through all that, he could say, yes, you meant that for evil, but God meant this for good. God afflicted me for your benefit, he could say. He also saw how God miraculously, providentially met his needs, not his wants and his greeds, but his needs through this whole thing, and then blessed his socks off in the end. But through it all, Joseph never quit being grateful for what God had provided for him. Matthew 18 teaches us a lesson from Jesus himself. You can read it on your own sometime, but let me just kind of summarize it. There was this guy that owed the big boss. And you could say he owed him, let's just pretend for a minute, $200,000. And the boss had the right to put him in prison. And the boss goes and catches him up and he says, you pay me what you owe me. And the guy's like, I can't, I can't. Okay, well then I'm going to throw you and your family in the debtor's prison. And he's like, I can't. Just give me a chance and I'll, I'll do everything I can to pay it. And the scripture says that that master, that the guy that was over him said, okay, I'll be merciful to you. So if that was you and I, we, we'd be like, hey, this is good. Chapter 13 without all the trouble, you know. Walked outside, the burden had been lifted. He and his family are not going to suffer the punishment that was rightfully his. And he walks out and he looks and he sees one of his buddies. Hey, didn't I loan you $20? Come over here for just a minute. Pushes him up against the wall and says, give me my $20. And the guy says, I can't do it. Well, I'm going to take you and your family and I'm going to throw you in prison for that. You think he was carrying a grudge? You think he had a root of bitterness inside him? You think he was overlooking a few things? Yeah, he was, because what happened next is astounding. The big boss heard about it and called him back in and said, hmm, you're a hypocrite. You are an absolute hypocrite, and you deserve to be punished. It's amazing what Jesus says on the heels of that little parable, because he tells his disciples It's going to be the same way for my children if they do that. That's scary. You see, sometimes when we're hurt, we allow that hurt to fester somewhere down inside because we don't feel like we deserve these things. And and, and we we let that, that hurt grow and start to fester in there until it eats away. And the scripture teaches us when it, when it gets to a point, it'll eat away your joy and your peace. You'll be the most bitter human being you've ever seen in your life. You'll look in the mirror after having gone to church and there will be no peace inside there because of the bitterness that has grown inside you. Well, I want to close with this today. Satan loves to plant this in you. He loves to plant this poison 
in what I would call unrepentant saints. One of my favorite pastors, and I, I, I want to read this to you. His name is John Piper. He says, if there's any way that Satan can exist to hold a grudge, he's going to do it. There are six goals that Satan has. The first one's this. In, 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 in getting professing Christians to hold grudges, Satan does that to make us put ourselves in the place of God. Ever since Eve was tempted in the Garden of Eden by Satan, it has been the same. Nothing helps in holding a grudge like thinking too highly of ourselves. And that's what Satan promised Eve. You'll be like God. The more exalted we are in our own eyes, the more justified we feel in holding a, a grudge against the person who offended us. If, if Satan can exceed, uh, succeed in making the grudge feel natural or justified, he will have gone a long way toward the, his goal of making us put ourselves in the place of God. Second thing, Satan does this to make us act as if we are the judge and not God. Romans 12 says, Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If we hold a grudge, then what we're saying is we're, we're acting as though God were not a just judge, that he wasn't doing his job, that we've got to step in and we've got to do it for him because God has failed at being the judge. Therefore, his word is wrong. Third, to make the cross of Christ look weak and foolish in the eyes of people. In the book of Ephesians, it teaches us that let me just read it to you. Ephesians chapter 4. Why don't you turn there with me? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now that's a tall order. Therefore, be imitators of of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Isn't that amazing? How you forgive people demonstrates to the rest of the world the forgiveness on the cross that Jesus gave to you and me. And if you don't do that and you carry the grudge and you carry the bitterness, you're saying the cross has no effect. It's weak and it's foolish and it's useless to us. What we do is when we hold a grudge, we cancel out the cross, the cross and we act as though God did this foolish thing because he dropped his infinite grudge against you and me. But we're going to hold on to our little grudge against sister so and so. And so Satan brings the cross of Christ into contempt. Fourth, Satan does this to cultivate disunity in the body of Christ. The book of Proverbs puts it this way. Chapter 15, verse 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Short tempers and long grudges breed strife in the middle of God's family. Amen? But John 17, Jesus teaches us that unity in the church is the great evidence to the world of the reality of Jesus living inside them. So if Satan can preserve and deepen grudges among God's people, he's going to have achieved his goal, the hiding of the reality of Christ to the rest of the world. Fifth, almost most harming, and this may be you. Satan does this to crush broken Christians into depression. Satan aims to crush broken Christians until they are de so depressed that they become useless. Paul tells about an instance in, in church discipline in, in, in the book of Corinthians. In Corinth, the church at Corinth was having a problem. And 
the, the guy that did the offense, he repented of the offense. And Paul tells the Corinthians, he, he says in, in 2 Corinthians, he tells them, so you should turn to forgive and comfort him. Don't pay him back. Don't grind him down. Don't crush him. But turn to forgive and comfort him. Or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him is the way the Apostle Paul puts that. You see, the burdens of life are so great sometimes that someone's grudge against us can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Just when it hurts the most, the resentful person will say something so they can crush that person and make it hurt as much as they've felt this hurt for so long a time. You can destroy a person by holding a grudge against them. And that is the very work of Satan. Listen to me. Cain held a grudge against his brother Abel and Satan has not given up on the power of a grudge. When you hold a grudge, you are living in the spirit of Satan. Lastly, Satan does this to help you commit suicide. He does this to help you destroy yourself. By holding a grudge, Satan will help you destroy yourself. And here's how he does it. He promises the moon, but he delivers misery. It's going to feel good when you pay them back. But when the unforgiving servant was thrown into jail, Jesus said to his disciples, so also my heavenly Father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I told you at the beginning of this message that I was going to speak what was not being written or said in Scripture. We don't see Joseph acting that way. Why? Joseph is the most Christ-like figure in the Old Testament that you'll find. The truth is, if Jesus forgave us in the same manner we forgive others, if Jesus carried a grudge or bitterness or resentment towards somebody that has wrongfully wronged us like we do then we would all be put in the debtor's prison now, I want you to think on these things dear family the love of Jesus Christ compels us to love one another Amen. and it compels us to forgive one another the love of Jesus Christ compels us to have a heart that's different than the rest of the world in fact, when he died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, the weight of forgiveness being lifted off of you ought to make your heart spring like joy and you could not hold a fault against another because you've been so forgiven yourself. And if you harbor this freight, all you're doing, it's like, <laughs> it's like pointing a gun at yourself and shooting it so that the recoil can hurt the, per the other person. It's stupid. In the end, you're going to lose and you're going to crush the body of Christ. But, but, if we get rid of that little root of bitterness, and we say, Lord, that person has wronged me, and your word says, vengeance is yours. They're in your hands. And I'm going to love them regardless. Then the love of Christ will be shown. Jesus will be lifted up. And in the end, when you walk across the finish line, Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray.